So welcome everyone to um, tonight's um, NSK Ikigai webinar. Um, tonight we have a great panel of dental therapists. Um, we are going to be discussing all things dental therapy. Um, we've had some questions submitted, so we'll work our way through those. But just before we start, um, I'm just going to ask um, our panelists to introduce themselves and just to note that this will be recorded and will be available on the um, Ikigai webinar um, archive within the next seven days or so. Okay, so um, Nina, we will start with you. If you could just introduce yourself, and let us know a bit about you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so my is Nina Farmer. I am a dental therapist and a nutritional therapist. So I'm dual trained, super passionate about holistic and Approach and whole body approach. Um, I've also worked as a dental therapist for 11 years now. I have worked at the same practice since I graduated and I've worked within my full scope from the beginning and um, within the NHS and private sector as well. Great, thank you Nina. Um, Zoe, we'll go to you next. Hi, yeah, I am. Um, I'm Zoe, I'm down in the West Country. I qualified in 2002 and uh, I do use my full scope in the community but in practice, I just work as a hygienist, um, so I don't use it there, sadly. Um, but I also work at the local university as a clinical supervisor. Amazing, thank you. Um, Elish, we'll go to you next. Hi, I'm Elish Duffy, I'm duly qualified. I actually qualified alongside Lauren in 2008 from the University of Dundee. And over the past, how many years? 15, 16 years, I've done yeah. quite a lot across the, um, between working in general practice, working in education, research, um, I recently completed a master's and I'm just starting a doctor program. Brilliant. Thank you, Elish. Um, you see we've matched jumpers tonight as well. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, Unintentionally. So. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Joe. let's go to you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. My name is Joanne Bowles. Um, I'm a duly acquired de dental hygienist and dental therapist. I qualified in 2000. I worked in community, um, initially using my full scope of practice. Then I went into uh, general practice, utilising full scope. And then uh, in the last 13, 14 years, I've been at the University of Liverpool, where I'm now um, under the undergraduate programme um, co-director there for BDS and BSc uh, programmes. Really passionate about education, um, specifically dental therapy. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to all of you for coming on tonight, by the way. We're really grateful to you for taking part. Um, for anyone that doesn't know me, um, my name is Lauren Long. And as Elish said, we qualified about 16 years ago, Elish. Um, I work in private practice in Edinburgh, utilising my full scope for the last 12 years or so now. Um, um, I also sit on BADT Council and um, run some courses for um, postgraduate dental therapists as well. So um, we'll get stuck into the questions. We've had some questions submitted. Um, so we'll start with those. So we'll have about around about 45 minutes worth of questions. And then um, we'll have an opportunity to submit any other questions that might come up from what we discussed during the evening um, at the end. So we'll have about 15 minutes of questions at the end just to wrap up. OK, so um, the first question that we've had submitted is... Um, how has the profession profession evolved, the profession of dental therapy, since the introduction of combined hygiene and therapy qualification and therapists being able to work in general practice since 2002? So we'll go to you first, Joe, for that. Wow, that's a big yeah. question. It's a big question. <laughs> that's a big question. I'll start. I could be here all night talking about this one, <laughs> yeah, um, okay. but, but we'll give it a go. Um, I think probably maybe for, for those that are newly qualified, um, it's probably useful to know a little bit of, of background and where everything has come from and how originally dental hygiene and dental therapy training was was very different and very separate. Um, dental therapist education started in the 1960s when New Cross opened because there was a shortage of dentists. That sounds familiar. Um, then they needed clinicians to be able to treat children due to the prevalence of, of dental caries in children. Again, that's that sounds familiar. Um, all those years ago. And so New Cross opened, it was training um, females to become dental auxiliaries at the time. Um, and that continued until the sort of the early 80s, where they then decided that actually job was done, didn't need to educate anymore. There was a big legal, legal battle and fight. And eventually um, it was decided that the training would continue with a lot less numbers. Um, the Royal London started its dual qualified, the, the combined programme at that point. Um, and then other programs followed on. And I think probably from that point, it meant that um, 
individual clinicians were able to do more because you you could train as a hygienist and therapist sort of alongside. So it was opening up um, scope of practice probably um, at that point. The scope of practice at, at, in those days wasn't what it is now. 2002 was then when we could work in general practice. Um, just after I qualified, when I was training, people kept saying, oh, well, one day you'll be able to work in practice one day. And it was one of those things that was just ever ongoing, ever ongoing. But eventually it came in 2002. We also then had the expansion of scope of practice at that point as well with ID blocks, um, pulp treatments and primary teeth, impressions, stainless steel crowns, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think things have just evolved and evolved. Um, and we've come such a long way um, in, in that time. Um, there's obviously been its challenges that in 2013, um, we were able to undertake direct access um, and the challenges that then come with that, with prescription medicines, radiographs, causes of treatment. But hopefully we're coming out the other side of, of all those challenges now. Um, so I think over the time, since the introduction of that combined programme, things have, have, have changed considerably. And it's just useful to reflect back on and think that actually things do change, things evolve, but it does take time. Yeah, absolutely. Hearing all that just makes you realise, doesn't it, how far we have actually come? Completely, completely. Amazing. Um, Alice, do you have any thoughts on that, of how we've evolved? No, I completely agree. It's, it is good to reflect back and see where did we start to where we are now. And I think if you look at dental therapy as a profession in its own right, it's not unusual compared to other professions, how we have become a profession, an autonomous profession in our own selves. Um, like you said, we started off as a sort of um, underdog, I suppose you would call it, you know, and it was you were brought in in a crisis situation. Whereas if we look at where we are now, we're becoming more autonomous, we're becoming more independent, we're recognized as a profession in ourselves, which is great because it can just keep evolving and developing and moving forward. And hopefully, like Joanne said, um, continue to make change. But it's when you reflect back and see where did we start to where we are now that you realize change has happened. It's just been slow. And I think that's the, the common theme across all healthcare professions when you when you look across the across the board. So obviously as things have evolved, um, you know, can anyone tell me about what kind of challenge they've faced in practice um or in any role um, of using their full scope of practice. Um, Zoe, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I find it quite difficult. I Because I qualified in 2002, I kind of had the same sort of um, info that Joe was just talking about where well, when we're at college, it's like, you know, you can take on the world now, you're going to go out there into general practice and you're going to be able to do all these different things. And um, and it wasn't quite like that. It, it was quite a slow burner. And I was quite fortunate to get a job with community about a year in. But up until then, they 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 don't spoke particularly that interested down here. Um, I can remember my boss coming in one day because he'd obviously read about dental therapy and um, he said, "Oh, I think I might let you do some. It sounds like a good idea." So I was like, "Amazing!" And he let me do the Fisher sealants. So um, that was all I was allowed to do. I wasn't allowed to pick up a drill at all. But things have changed dramatically, and and I think it's probably a generational thing where. Dentists are now being trained alongside dental therapists and they just know who they are. They understand what they can do. They totally um, respect the fact that their, their training is very similar, if not exactly the same. And um, any therapist can do a filling as good as any dentist. I really believe that it's it's a parallel and um, it should be more utilised. It's, it's a great thing. But, but I think it, it everything takes time, like we've just said. And it's the, the newer dentists coming in will, will help to evolve that. I think it, it will be a two-way thing. Yeah, absolutely. So it must have been quite an interesting time in 2002, qualifying just on the cusp of when you could start working in general It practice. was, because we, we qualified in the summer. So we, we finished university where we weren't allowed to do an ID block at all. And then pretty much the day I qualified, the next day they were like, oh, we've brought these things out. And we hadn't done it, so we then had to go back to uni to do the course, oh. which was a bit bizarre. But um, yeah. it's just it's one of those things. I mean, it. everyone says, oh, you know, the evolution and everything. But um, when I agreed to do this thing, I was thinking back on my career, and actually it's been an amazing sort of 25 years. And everything is really, really slow. But actually there's an awful lot that's happened as well. So as slow as it's been, there's been so much change that it has gone quite quickly as well, if, if in a roundabout way. 
very interesting. Yeah. It is a lot, isn't it, for 20 mm -hmm. odd years. And my experience was pretty similar to you. So I graduated um, what, six years after you and um, still for the first kind of four years or so. Um, I did mainly hygiene. I didn't really pick up a high speed. Um, I remember suggesting it to I had a very similar response to your dentist in that. <laughs> You know, they they didn't really, they kind of knew what a therapist was, but they weren't really sure. Um, the dentist that I worked for was, he was kind of nearly near retiring age. He was, you know, he just had not kept himself up to date. And he was, you know, he was looked a bit horrified when I suggested that he was like, oh, can you do that? Like, are you allowed to do that? You know, he just didn't have a clue. So I just knew that I was fighting a losing battle. Um, and then luckily when I moved to my current practice, which I'm still in 12 years later, and um, it was just a completely different story. So um, we'll probably talk about later about the team and how important that is. But I think just having that supportive environment to really kind of nurture you and push you on to use your full scope is vitally important in our journey, isn't absolutely. it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, speaking about general practice, so how well integrated do we think dental therapists are into general practice? Um, and do we think there's any difference between NHS and private? We'll go to you. That, Joe. I'm going to pass that on to somebody else because private NHS and private practice is not my that's okay that's not fine. my cup of tea that's fine. so, <laughs> so there's right. probably somebody else that can answer that one better than me that's okay that's fine um Nina can we go to you because I know you do some NHS some yeah. private so maybe you can give us some insight into that well I just I feel very fortunate because I've been utilized from day one in sort of both sort of circumstances but actually when I was beginning my journey working there I remember a lot of my colleagues that uh, were also qualifying weren't actually able to do to that go to work to their full scope um, and also there was this sort of thought that we were a lot slower you know and it was you know it was, there, was, there was a bit of conversation about renum renum remuneration I can't say that word and about um, I had some particular problems with a dentist wanting to send me sort of NHS work because obviously they were paying me for my time and perhaps I would take a little bit longer so there was a bit of an issue um, with that also with the private we tend to generate our own private work because it's a really good source of income so I don't tend to get many referrals with that so with you know with the NHS I tend to get big longer treatment plans perhaps that take a bit more time up and then with the, with the private work I don't tend to get sort of referred so I do think it's really utilized but you've got to have really good communication about how you do it otherwise you can end up you know getting these patients with really long treatment plans which I absolutely love doing but obviously if you're doing that all the time you know it can really impact in your earnings as well so it's about I think communicating that and having really good strong boundaries yeah absolutely and um, has anyone else got any insight into that kind of well it depends practice? on the, the jurisdiction that you're working in because I know when I worked in NHS in Scotland it was fee per item so it was slightly different yeah. to UDAs in in England so it does depend on the jurisdiction that you're working within and again I think there's an element of depending on what the team environment and you know the team and how receptive the practice are to the dental therapist if they want to integrate it and make that model work. I know I've certainly had a um, fantastic experience in NHS practice where you've been fully utilized and remunerated accordingly based on your time. So um, I do think it varies across where depending on where you're working and what the systems are. And again, there's so many factors involved, communication, teamwork, you know, um, just to name a few of them. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so much that goes into it. And as you say, it's different in different parts of the UK as well. So I think that can make a big impact on how, you know, well utilised maybe therapists are in specific practices. Um, Ailish, you just touched on there just about the team. Um, so how important do you think that the dental team is in allowing dental therapists to utilise their full scope? Well, I was thinking about this earlier in terms of teamwork and from a dental therapy perspective. And I think it comes back to empowering the whole team and the whole team feeling like their skills and their skill mix are optimized and used. And I suppose if you have a good team environment within the practice, everyone is going to thrive. And it comes back to that open, clear communication. All team members need to understand the scope of the dental therapist. And I suppose looking at it from the point of view of we want to be utilized fully, but in order to do that, it's important that the dentists understand the value of that and you know they can use different skills they're not going to be doing their some for example some dentists really don't like doing composites for example they prefer to do high-end work and the clear communication within the team to show the value of the dental therapist and um, brings it out in for everyone's benefit but I do 
And I do think it comes back to the core elements of teamwork and what we mentioned briefly earlier about training together to understand each other's role and to have respect across the whole team. Obviously, even if we look at the S3 guidance and the idea of the dental nurse looking at the stage one, you know, utilizing skills across the board to empower all members of the dental team will eventually lead to us all being utilized properly and, and everyone feeling empowered. Yeah, fab. Um, so Joe, I know that um, I believe at um, your university um, that the dental students and the dental therapy students train quite closely together. Is that right? Do you feel that that has an impact on how you dental therapists are perceived? I think it's probably early early stages to, to yeah. kind of tell that, but the students are fully integrated. So for the yeah. first three years, they're all learning within the scope of practice of the dental therapist. So they all start together. Every single session they have is the same. Um, their assessments are the same, everything is the same, the standard is the same, there is no different. You mentioned before somebody um, about restorations and standards of restorations, well it's no different. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're all trained together to the same standard, same assessments, um, and there's some fantastic friendships and things coming out um, of that, and it's those friendships, those long-lasting friendships that people make at university and things that hopefully will help bring the profession um, to be sort of more efficient with their team working and, and more effective. Um, so I think time will tell, um, but I think signs are good um, from what we see you know, sort of in the short term. Um, and fingers crossed that, yeah, it makes a longer term impact. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a great model, I think, you know, that everyone knows, because I remember that we did train with dental students, didn't we, Elish? But then I remember yeah. our tutors had to go in and like give them like talk about you know what a dental therapist was and all this because they, they saw bits of what we did so we did things like radiography and clinical medical sciences and these kind of things with them but I remember her telling us that like she got heckled by some of them like they were being horrible to her so I, it sounds like so much better if we were all training together you know and they'd know from the start what we what we were doing and actually we talk about the students being integrated but from a staffing perspective as well mm -hmm. our, our staffing cohort staffing body is a whole mixture um dental therapists dentists, um, dental nurse as well, and everybody is is all in it together. And we all work as one big team, as one big school, and that, and that's how we want the students to be. So I think we, we kind of have to set up, set those examples from the school, um, and that seems to have worked really well as well. And again, it's utilizing everybody's strengths um, and and for, for their worth, really. Yeah, absolutely. And then that should set the tone for going into practice, right? You know, they should be able yeah. to just continue that. <clears throat> Yeah. Brilliant. Zoe, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I reckon it's with you. It it's, sounds very similar. Um, it's a very positive environment and, and they've integrated the two two sets of students together. And you, you can tell that they're friends with each other because they share houses together. And and I think that if you're brought up into that environment, then you just, it's just accepted. It's nothing is new. And times have changed. There's lots of therapists now I've done are going through the A level route rather than like me when I was a dental nurse and come through the diploma route. So they they all start from a very level playing field, and um, you know the, the therapy intake is is a high grade intake. It's it's not any less, and you can you know the caliber is is just the same and it's brilliant. But you know, in the community we have um, a really wide range of uh, people that work there, from the consultants down to the OHE nurses, and the, the team approach is vital. One person can't do it on their own. You have to have a multi-skill sort of setup. It just doesn't work else. And we are, I guess, probably more lucky than general practice because we have a lot more time. But um, the whole team is in, included in everything and, uh, and it's all utilised and it just works well. Awesome. Thank you, Zoe. So we've talked about um, where we started education, getting into practice. So what kind of opportunities do we think there are for dental therapists for our career progression and um, so we'll start with you Nina for that one loads <laughs> yeah, I think there is there is so much out there isn't there now especially you know with the way that we do our in-house CPD and we've got our own uh, personal development plans as well and, as, and we can we can get our passions and make it relevant to us and I know I'm probably saying that from my own experiences with nutritional therapy as well but I think there is so much out there that we can now do that bring a bit of us to really enjoy our learning. Um, I I think the multidisciplinary approach is, there's a lot, isn't there, coming up now with the evidence, the whole body approach and how to 
um, work with, with other team members, but also to become dual trainer, just go that a little bit further. We've got coaches, we've got mentors, we've got educators, we've got people going into research as well. Um, because, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the panel, but sometimes I find five days of this job quite tough on my body. Um, uh, so it's quite nice that I can do other things on, on different days and, and, and use my career in that way as well. And it helps me to feel really fulfilled. I don't know about, about anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are so many opportunities nowadays, aren't there? Um, I think actually each one of us has all done something slightly different. So we'll yeah. go to you next, Dalish, and you can talk about how you've progressed your career. Thank um, you, I suppose in terms of career progression, like you said, there is something out there for everyone. If you can tap into what your interests are and what makes you passionate about the career that you started off. Going back to something similar to what Joel said earlier about reflecting back, I always think it's important to think back to why did I go into this career in the first place? What was it that drove me to apply to dental school? Because I do feel sometimes you can get caught up in the day to day and forget about that. And if you do reflect back, it does show you, well, where's my passion? And you'll never really go wrong with looking at CPD courses or further education, master's, postgrad, etc. Now, interestingly, um, you mentioned research as well. I, I found that through doing my master's in in UCL, I was much more confident to look at research and I ended up working in a research role. And that was something a little bit different to what I suppose I envisioned where I where I would be. But it was great. Um, it was great to see the opportunities, especially now if you look online, the opportunities coming up for dental therapists to join in with research, which I suppose goes back to our point earlier about how has the career evolved? It's gone away from being, I suppose, supplementary to dentists to profession in our own right that we do have these career developments now. And like I said, there's there is ample opportunity out there for further education. I think Zoe, you can talk about that as well because I recently met you, haven't finished your <laughs> your program. But it does it does open your eyes to the opportunities that's out there when you do a, a do a further education course. And Lauren, I know you've you've done some again recently as well. And Nina, so it does um it does show you what the world can offer if we open our eyes and we we keep growing as a, a grown as a profession and keep educating ourselves. And do you have any advice for anyone that would like to go into research or find out more about it? Is there anything they can look at? Again, I think, where do your passions lie? What is it you'd like to look at? That's the first thing. And to look at what courses are available out there to develop your skills. Um, it's not necessary to have further or higher education or you know postgraduate education, but it does help your confidence. I think you'll all agree from everyone that's done postgraduate education that having that behind you does grow you as a person and it makes you more confident to to push the world on and to drive on and say well actually I am here to 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 move and to change this and from I suppose if I was a new graduate and I wanted to get into that area if I find my passions I look out to who's in those areas that's looking at these things already what courses are out there that could help me develop my research skills or my critical thinking skills or you know my um, clinical skills if it's something like that that interests um, the person then that's a starting point and networking and CPD and finding out who in the profession can guide them and mentor them and coach them in the right directions is probably a good starting point at this point Perfect and um, Ailish just touched on there as a way that you've been doing some further education to progress your career so do you want to tell us a bit about that just about what um, how you feel that's kind of helped you in your career? Yeah sure so I've um I've just completed a postgrad diploma in oral and positive health and um, I kind of felt about it by chance. I didn't, I wasn't particularly looking at anything. I was really happy in my day-to-day -day job. I've got quite a varied job. I feel quite lucky already. And um, it was just, it just looked interesting. And, and and it's right, really, you, you kind of, you go along these things and then and it opens doors that you didn't realise were there. So um no, when you go on a, a general course, you, you do to just justify what you know already. You think, yeah, I'm kind of up there with everybody else. I know that stuff. But this course definitely took it to a different level. It made you think about other things that you never really understood um, that were possible to, to go into. You know, I would have never have contemplated some of the things that I'd read or, or the research or the, the projects I did. And it definitely set a spark in thinking, oh, maybe I could go into that. And it does, it's a bit like a spider web. You know, you, you go, you look at this, and then it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was just fantastic. And it definitely gives you confidence, not only clinically or, you know, education wise, really, but personally too. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a great feeling to, to complete something like that. I definitely recommend it to anybody. 
Brilliant. And as you say, sometimes when you do, you know, something that you just think sounds interesting, something that maybe you want to learn about, it helps you then discover, doesn't it? As you say, what you're passionate absolutely. about, what you might like to explore more. Yeah, absolutely. So, Joe, have you got any thoughts on career progression? I think <clears throat> I would never have imagined being in the position I'm in now when I was a student or newly qualified. Um, and I think of the advice I often give to the students that are, are just finishing is to kind of say, well, never say never. Um, take opportunities as they come along, um, but but do what you enjoy. Um, and a, a useful bit of advice somebody gave me once was because I was thinking, well, what am I going to do next? I wanted to do something, but I couldn't work out what it was. And I was thinking, oh, well, I'll do postgraduate course in sort of clinical area and somebody says to me well is it the clinical aspect you want to do or is it more education side of things you want to do and so it, it's about finding finding what is right for you um and the education was something that I wanted to do more of so then I did a postgraduate certificate um diploma and then completed my master's um in learning and teaching in higher education um a few years ago and then that's now where what I do if you sort of mean um and the educational research that I get involved with as well within the school um, so that's where my career has taken me and I think it's important that everybody is completely different and, and sometimes people can get a bit worried about what other people are doing and, and actually just focus on you just do what you enjoy and everybody will find their way because everybody's path is slightly different um, but I think it's important to to do what you enjoy yeah, absolutely. We're all individuals. That's the thing, isn't it? And there are lots of courses out there that, you know, people might be, you know, sometimes things become trendy, you know, and everyone's going on a certain course. But if it's not for you and you're not going to find value in it, I think it's worth always just I always try to think, you know, before I do any sort of kind of CPD, any courses, you know, like, is, is it something I really want to do that I'm going to learn? I'm going to find useful as well, you know, so I think it's really worth just individually thinking about that before kind of paying out the money to do something. So that leads us quite nicely on to, um, do we think there are enough training and CPD opportunities for dental therapists? Um, and we'll go to you, Eilish, first for that, if you don't mind. Um, I suppose in terms of CPD and um, short courses, there are a number and they're growing. And I suppose, Lauren, <laughs> As we know, we, we have a, a short CPD course for upskilling and um, for dental therapy. Could there be more? Absolutely. And I think there is a market out there. I think there's there's a want out there for it as well. But if you look, I suppose, a postgraduate specific dental therapy training, there isn't a huge amount available. And I suppose if we think about some of the master's programs for from um, dental therapy, you know, that have been on offer and are no longer on offer, there is a question and a query as to demand and, and what is why is there not available? Um, I, I personally would like to see more available because I think there's a there's a want for it. Um, but as we know from education from universities, it's a lot of it is um a lot of money and other factors involved. And I'm sure Joe, you would agree with me in that sense in terms of postgraduate and the 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 hands-on skills training. I would like to see more, but I think there's a huge challenge in in achieving that. Yeah, completely, completely. Um, I think the other thing is that when there have been sort of the po those postgraduate clinical courses before that are, are kind of now sometimes not running anymore, is to think actually they 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 cost you a lot of money as a, as an individual to pay out, and what gain do you get back from it um, afterwards? Can you do anything differently? Is your scope of practice changed? It hasn't, but sometimes it's the doors that it opens from from doing that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it would be good to see more of those courses there but again it, it's a financial thing that it comes down to for the people setting it up and running it in the first place and then those people wanting to to take part in those courses and, and where do they fund and how do they fund those um yeah and it's difficult financial times at the moment so as well absolutely what do you think nina I was thinking because I was thinking about the CPD and the things that are available with, with regard mm -hmm. to CPD. I was thinking mm -hmm. there is loads, isn't there? With you know, we've got the company, the society, we've got the deaneries, which are fantastic as well. And I think sometimes if you, I've spoken to a few sort of newly qualified um, recently, and they've sort of said, "Oh, there's so much out there. I don't know what to do." And I've thought, you know, maybe go and look and have having a look on the deanery and seeing something you can dip your toe in and see if that's something you'd like to take a little bit further, and then. And have a look at maybe a, a sort of a large course but the Ailish just touched on this earlier and I think 
really positive thing is to get maybe perhaps a mentor to help you to kind of learn perhaps what it is that you are passionate about and what you'd like to invest in because like joe said it's it's a lot of money as well and uh, so so i think that is something i think would be a really great starting point when you're when you're looking for courses and cpd as well awesome um so where do we think that um dental education for therapists will go in the future um we'll go to you zoe if you don't mind what do you see happening in the future with training i think i think it um I think there will be more postgrad education for therapists. I think it is a bit limited at the moment, um, but there's definitely a there's definitely a hunger for it. You know, things have changed so much. We are not dentist led anymore. We are team led, and therapists are professionals in their own right, and um, they they strive to to better themselves just like everybody else. And it just like you say, it just probably hasn't had a need quite as much as it has already. I think that that definitely will open a lot of doors but it, we're just not there yet you know things have progressed quite quite well and I think maybe since Covid or maybe before now that we're doing lots more online things are becoming much more accessible to to everybody you know I live in the west country where it's quite difficult to get to places quite often I've got two young children I can't I would love to do some of the big courses but for me to get up to Birmingham or London it, you know it's a weekend away it's logistically very difficult Whereas doing things online means that it's accessible to all and, and that's really favorable favorable for people like me. So um, the online thing is fabulous. And there's a hunger for, for learning. You know, people, this is an exciting career. And um, I think once you've done one thing, you definitely find a need to want to do something else. Uh, Joe was right, really. I, when I finished my postgrad course, I thought, right, I'm going to go and do a master's. And um, when the consultant said, well, what for? You know, you, you, you've got to make it viable for yourself. But learning is learning. And once you've learned one thing, you want to learn another and then you want to learn something else. It doesn't all have to be about money. So I think that this will this will get bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more therapists come into play. Yeah, I think so. I think, Zoe, um, you just touched on there. If, if someone had told us five years ago that we'd all be learning like loads online, you know, lots of things would be available in webinar form i think we would all have been like really oh and um, things gosh, have changed yeah. so much in five years haven't they four years well i didn't want to spend 50 quid on a course let alone thousands and, <laughs> and now here we are and, uh, and i can't wait to do another it's crazy yeah amazing <laughs> um joe what do you think about the future of dental education i think i mean we could think of it i mean i often think of it from an undergraduate perspective yeah um, because that's that's my day job and i think that will evolve um quite a bit as well i think um the gdc nhse um advancing dental care report that came back from education training review was all about um skill mix flexible um educational models training models for dentists and dental therapists we need to think about quality and diversity sustainability all these things that kind of need to need to fit in um interprofessional learning more so with the wider healthcare team as well so i think things things could evolve um, quite a lot really. Um, and maybe even scope of practice evolving and changing um, as well. We've got changes within technology, changes with materials and things. Who knows? Who knows? Exciting times, I would say. Yes, and Ailish, you're involved in education as well. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Exactly, just what Joe was saying, like the use of AI simulation and the use of equality and diversity and more accessibility into undergraduate and looking at it from all the healthcare providers and across interprofessional education with the ideal to lead to more interprofessional collaboration at a postgrad and, and in the working world, you know, to, to meet the healthcare policies that's been outlined from that perspective. Um, yeah, I think there's, it's a huge question. <laughs> so where do we see it going? But I do think, yeah, the introduction of, like I say, we're definitely going to see more simulation in terms of AI and looking at the students coming through the door now and how do they learn and what's their world and how are we going to make them learn within their world so that they can become trained as dental therapists and go out into the working world. So I do think we we have a lot to learn, but also, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of exciting times ahead in terms of how the education process will evolve. Amazing. So we're just um, a few minutes left before we go to um, audience questions. So if you want to start popping your questions into the box, that would be lovely. And we'll go through those in a second. But we're going to finish with a big question that I'm going to ask all of you. So what would you hope 
for dental therapy in the next 10 years. So what will be your hope for the future within 10 years time? Where would we be in 10 years time? Just some ideas, you know, who would like to go first? I think a lot more awareness of who we are and what we do. Yeah. Um, in generally for, for patients um, and also yet yeah, more of the wider dental team sort of mean I think we're we're getting there um but it's 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 just getting out there further I think um and and being a professionals in our own right yeah absolutely I totally agree with that Joe because I think even um I was just thinking about this today actually that even from you know 16 years ago when we graduated Elish um you know every single job advert would be for a hygienist and then you had to go in and you had to explain you know that you were duly qualified you were a hygienist but you were also a dental therapist um, and you had to kind of fight um and I find that now actually in my area anyway I know it does vary regionally that most of the adverts are actually for dental therapists so it's easier to go in I think and um you know it's still sometimes they're still not fully advertising for a dental therapist but I think it's easier to go in then and um you know, be on the right foot to go in and speak to the team about, you know, what you would like to offer about your scope of practice. And so um, I think that would be my hope as well, is that we're just um, being treated as autonomous clinicians who can do as good a restoration as a dentist, Zoe, like you just said. <laughs> um, and that, um, yeah, just that we um, have the respect that we deserve and that the public know who we are and what we can do for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Zoe? What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree, really. But I, I, I'd love to see um, more sort of uh, therapy led practices, um, therapists out there on their own who have bought the practice a bit like the the hygiene um, places now. I think I think that's a it's a great thing. So therapists learn so much that that dentists do that it it just makes sense to utilise their skills. And um, if it was therapy led, it would it would just even out the skill mix. People would more people would get seen. It would be fair around. I just. I can see that coming in a lot more. Awesome. How about you, Elish? I suppose if I reflect back on one of my favourite jobs was when I was working in a diabetes centre doing research and the endocrine, endocrinologists, podiatrists, various different members of the healthcare team saying, why are you here? What, what's your purpose? What's your role? And we were um, investigating periodontal disease if, if the bacteria in the pockets were related to the foot ulcers. And I found I learned so much within that role about other healthcare professionals and they learned about our role. And I suppose if I was to fast forward 10 years time, I would love to see the integration of dental therapy across all sectors, you know, within hospitals in a broader range from the preventative side of things for systemic disease, because there's so much we can do. And like when I reflect back on that role and how far I had introduced the role within the team, it was so rewarding and it was lovely to work with other professionals outside of dentistry as well, although you love your dental colleagues, it would be nice to be part of the wider team and look at the holistic approach of the patient on a broader sense as well to be to be included in that. Um, obviously, there's a long way to go in terms of <laughs> being integrated to the wider team, but that would be, if you ask me what my dream would be, that would be where I'd like to see it going. Amazing. I think that's definitely needed as well, isn't it? As more and more research comes out about the, um, you know, kind of oral systemic connection, I think that will progress hopefully um nina how about you what do you think he just was nodding my head so much that he's just talking with that well, you're just so breaking up a little bit but the same thing that i thought oh, sorry can you hear me now okay yeah can you hear me can you hear now? all right sorry i don't know what you heard then so i can i just okay. said i was okay. nodding my head frantically when alish was speaking because that's that's my dream too you know i love working with other health professionals about whole patient care um, so, you know, multidisciplinary clinics, all, all of that is something. And obviously what you said, Lauren, about us being autonomous, you know, it's just a really nice picture, isn't it? I was just reflecting when I graduated, it was the year direct access came out. Um, that was a thing. And then all of a sudden, here we are now. We've got, you know, therapy led. We've got uh, exemptions in process. We've got all of this stuff and we've got the multidisciplinary approach being talked about. And it, it's going in the right direction, isn't it? And if you go back to 2002, how far we've come. I mean, the sky's the limit, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think the sky is definitely limited. That's a good note to finish on, Nina, <laughs> with the questions that we had submitted. Um, let me just have a little look in the chat box and see um, what people are asking. Oh my goodness, we've got loads of questions, right? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, so someone is asking, there's a big push for online learning platforms. Do you recommend any online learning in particular, um, like Dentinal Tubules, Hybrid Layer, I don't know that one, or Ripe Global? Has anyone got any favorite online learning platforms that they'd like to talk about or anything they do online? Yeah, I quite I'm like um, with any of them. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's fine. Um, I use dentinal tubules a lot. Um, I quite like it because um, I think in the past I used to do. I think it used to be called Isofarm, but it's now a Jellio. Um, and it did kind of feel a little bit just like box ticking. And um, whereas I feel um, some of the other platforms like dentinal tubules do go a bit more in depth. Um, you actually kind of learn a lot more. I think um, rather than just um. You know, kind of ticking off your verifiable CPD that you have to do. And I would definitely say from a, a growth perspective, that's a good one um, to look into. Does anyone else use anything online that they like? I think I was just going to say about dentinal tubules as well, mm -hmm. because you can you can really personalize your learning, I think, with it, can't you? Mm -hmm. I don't use it myself, um, mm -hmm. but from what I've heard, you can personalize your learning and set out a really clear plan. And there's resources there that you can make use of. And I think it's probably quite reasonably priced as well, which is a big factor. Yeah, I think you can um you can definitely go on because I do my PDP on there and you can basically just go on and you know make it really personal and then it will guide you into which courses to do on the website. It's really it's quite slick the way it works. I quite like it. Um and you can add things as you go, you know, if you think some of something else, you can add another um, topic to it as well. So it's really good. Um let me just have a little look and see what else people are asking. Da, 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 da. Um Oh, does anyone use any AI software or note taking software? It's a good no. question, but no. <laughs> no. I know there are a few out there. There is um Kuroku, which I think is one that you um can basically have like templates and you can click and basically it writes your notes for you just more quickly. Um I think there's also one called Digital TCO, which um some of the dentists in my practice have been trialing which is kind of an audio um, AI so you you speak into a little thing and it um, does it all for you and you can say something like you know crown prep and it will put in your template and whatnot so I think those are becoming a bit more common nowadays to use but I haven't personally um, tried any of them. Um, the only one I've so, tried is the Florida probe when you call it out and it records it for you. Oh yeah and the, the voice first works. One you, yeah the first one you mentioned there okay, beginning with K I have trialed that and I did find mm -hmm. that quite um quite nice but there is a subscription charge to it so it's just bearing in mind again the financial element of of that yeah um does anyone think that there is a north south divide on therapy work and vacancies um due to um well, this person said there's a higher number of dentists in the south compared to the north don't know um I do know, I feel I can only speak for being in Scotland because I'm in Scotland um, and we're all in different regions, but I think dental therapy is quite well utilised up here. Um, kind of anecdotally from what I hear from other people, I think it's not so well utilised, maybe in the London area, but as I say, I'm not really sure because I don't work down there. Um, how do you feel it is in the Midlands, Nina? I know that's yeah. where you are. We've got quite a good network in the Midlands. There's lots of us working in the Midlands, so I feel like it's, it's utilised quite well. Awesome. Um, I would say in the northwest as well as um good utilization there of, of therapists, especially sort of the new graduates going out, lots of them going into practice, lots of them going to foundation training. So there's lots of opportunities um out there. Okay, so um someone has said um they feel that we're still quite undervalued from a rate perspective. Um and the often principles will still dictate kind of self-employed terms and things like that. Does anyone have any tips on negotiating? in practice or otherwise? I think you just have to be a bit brave. Mm. And, um, you know, you are self-employed. You're, you're going in, you say your rates, and you're, you have to um, put across your self-worth. And I think if you're open and honest, then you'll get a better response. We've been so, for so many years, we've been dictated to for such a long time that we just it's easy just to go and say okay 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 but um I think 
you know, if, if you feel that you really need a pay rise or you feel like you're being undervalued, you just have to have that conversation. And sometimes maybe that practice just isn't for you. You have to try a few practices really before you find the one that you really settle in sometimes. So um, have a conversation and see where that leads. If, if you get a blanket no, and it's just down to finances, then maybe it's worth just having a rethink of what you want from your career. Now there's, there's, there's always somebody that would have you. Absolutely. I think at the minute as well, it is, there are quite a lot of vacancies at the moment. So I think it is a good time as a dental therapist to be thinking about, um, you know, if you're thinking of moving practices, moving jobs, kind of if you're going to move maybe to community, things like that, um, you know, to actually, you know, have a good think about the kind of team you want to work in and what you want to be doing. Do you want to be working to your full scope? Um, something in general practice that I find quite useful as someone who, recruits therapists um is to have a lot more therapists now will have a portfolio of their work which can be quite nice um you don't you don't have to have like we're not talking you have to buy like an expensive camera and like that take loads of fancy photos literally some people take photos on a you know an i an iphone that's maybe not like connected to the cloud and whatnot just for gdpr and whatnot but um just having kind of evidence of your work and what you're passionate about things you do outside of the clinic all these kind of things it kind of just sets you apart from um maybe the other candidates and um just I, th I think just having passion I think that's I think as someone who as I say employees dental therapists um for a group um, I think just seeing passion that people really actually enjoy their jobs and want to help patients and want to work as part of a team and um, I think integration into the team is a massive a massive part of it you know that they want to work with with everyone whereas you know um I think we'll probably all remember maybe you know years ago when you used to literally go into your little surgery at the start of the day and you might not see anybody until lunchtime and then you wouldn't see anyone until the end of the day you know it's it's hopefully not like that as much anymore Um, I do feel that team integration has come a long way and um, you know speak to your dentist tell them what you can offer them you can direct work towards them they can direct work towards you it should be a reciprocal relationship you know and so I think just yeah go in negotiate show them what you can do don't feel that you have to settle you know for what you want I think is what I would say I think it's really useful to find out what kind of other people are getting paid in your, that area as well isn't yeah. it sometimes I know that's helped a colleague of mine in the past as well we had a conversation in a group and they were quite different to the rest of us and then they went away and had a conversation and actually it went very positively because they'd been somewhere a long time and that person hadn't really realized and I think like you say feeling undervalued for a long period of time can impact the happiness can't it as well so mm -hmm. Um, someone is asking, do we think that loops help with dental therapy work? Um, and if so, do we have any that we would recommend? Anyone wear loops? Yeah. I don't actually wear loops. So. No. Um, I do wear loops. Um, uh, mine are Bryant Dental ones. Um, I really like them. They have a wireless light and whatnot. They're really handy. You can like clip it on and off. It's magnetic. Um, so if it runs out during, you can get your nurse to quickly whip it off and put the other one back on. Um, I really like them. Mine are, I think, three times magnification, um, and I find that enough. Although I do know some people use five. Um, I, they're expensive loops, so I'm not looking at upgrading just yet. But maybe when I do, I might, I might go up a little bit. But I think generally for therapy work, kind of three to five times magnification is what most people are are wearing. Yeah, I think it's important to get them the suit you and to be well measured because i've tried yeah, them in the past absolutely. and found them un uncomfortable so hence i yeah. don't use them but i do think that's important to shop around and to have a look at what's been provided and that they work well for you before you invest yeah i think get reviews from other people as well because yeah. some people um you know will tell you they've had good experiences with companies bad experiences with companies or the price and things you've got to take into consideration as well but most companies will come out and measure you properly you know to make sure that they're they're right so just um, I say find something that works for you. It's probably worth thinking about so dentistry shows and things for things like loops, isn't it? So to mm -hmm. me, it's a good opportunity to go and try different brands and different companies. They often have special offers running at the same time. It's probably a good time to buy them. So um, absolutely, just a plug for the dentistry shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not great. No, they, to be fair, you can. Yeah, you can definitely go around and try. There's always at least maybe. At least maybe three or four different brands there aren't there Joe so you can go around yeah, and you can yeah. try them all on and mm -hmm. see what you think you'll like 
Um, someone is asking, is it financially worth upskilling from a hygienist qualification to a therapy with a top up year at the uni? What's everyone think? I, I'm going to say it's not all about money. Um, I think it's about um, what you want to get out of out of your profession, how you maybe want to help people, your values. I suppose it comes down to your values. Um, I never went into de dental therapy and working in community for the money. Um, when I when I finished, somebody said to me, "Oh, but you could earn x x amount of money working in in private practice on Holly Street as a hygienist." I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I wanted to go out into community and help people um, and to treat disease and and make a difference. And it doesn't always come with a lot of money. Um, but job satisfaction is a is a big thing. So I think it's probably an individual thing, depending on individual circumstances um, as well from a financial perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we said earlier, wasn't it? So don't just um, feel like you have to follow the crowd and go and do something if you're not sure. Um, think about what your passions are and as you say Joe your values you know why would you want to get into it and you know why would you want to do it really Um, I think dental therapy is pretty well financially rewarded but um, I say I think you need to look at your area um, and, and you know kind of what people are getting paid in your area whether it'll be worth it for you and um, obviously it probably does have to be financially viable as well as you know being your passion but um, yeah just have a good think about whether it's something that you'd like to do first of all um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? No, I agree. Go back to what I said at the start when we said, why did we go into the career in the first place? Totally agree with what Joe was saying there. Why is it you want to go in, money aside? Like, what, what is it that's driving you to think about dental therapy as opposed to working as a hygienist? You know, there's obviously something that interests you, but if it's all, if, if, if the decision is financially viable, I would park the finances for now and have a look at, like you said, What's the employment opportunity for dental therapy? How well is it utilized in your area? And what's your passion and your your reasoning for wanting having the interest in the upskilling? Um that should help in terms of making that decision because if it's on money alone, it's a very difficult question to answer. Awesome. So I think finally, probably just one last question. Um someone is asking, um, what are the most educational social media accounts to follow? Um, I'm going to get in there first with a quick plug for Ikigai and say that um, if you join our Facebook group um, we post courses on there all the time kind of in-person courses that you can attend and um, webinars like this and um, if you, you're signed up obviously for tonight so you will get notifications about any upcoming webinars and um, our Instagram or on Instagram as well and um, yeah all kinds of things get posted on there all different types of courses I mean recently we've had radiography course with a specialist radiographer we've had implant courses um, we've have got a minced course coming up um, with NSK in the next couple of weeks. So there's there's lots going on. So um, follow us and, um, you know, see what, as you say, tickles your fancy because we've got lots of different things going on. Um, anyone else got any favourite social media accounts that they like? I've been enjoying your dental besties from their new, their, 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 they've brought their new podcast out, haven't they? They've been doing some fun things as well. I know it's not as more sort of education like courses, mm -hmm. but I know they're bringing out women's um bridge show i think next year so th that's something i've been enjoying recently amazing yeah, not, I've actually, got in there. <laughs> yeah that's a good one anyone else i think it's probably worth plugging the um the associations um yeah. work that badt do the work bsdht do um i didn't say before that i'm the secretary and chair elect for badt so i'll just hold my hand up for that one um just, just a, again with a quick plug but again there's lots of webinars and things that come through um, from the associations and they're often free so for members um, it's a bit of a um, yeah why why wouldn't you join um, for all the benefits that you get and the education that you get from them as well so yeah and I know we've not spoken much about it but there's in-person events as well you know that we I think it's important to keep those up as well as doing online because there's no better connections that you make than in person that you learn really well in person as well. So um, we've got the BSDHT Oral Health Conference coming up and um, BADT have a program at Dental Tubules Congress um, coming up in a few weeks and um, there's still a few places left for that. So again, have a look at the program, see what um, appeals to you and then go from there. Yeah, Anyone the face-to-face face, face is, is so good so to me for networking meeting up with people and and I think in the past few years we haven't done it because of covid and then we've got out of the habit of doing it but it, it's it's such a good opportunity so if people haven't tried these kind of things I'd probably say 
put it in your personal development plan and and, and get out there and, and meet a few more people. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else got any social media accounts that they like? No, I'm terrible no. at social media, so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't like it. <laughs> um, oh, someone's asking about the NSK Minced course. Um, we can put some details of that if you're on the Ikigai um, Facebook page. Um, we can put, I'll post details of that afterwards just so you can get um, info on that. It's on the 28th of September, which is in is that next week. I think that's next week. Next um, week, yeah in Letchworth I think so um we'll send we'll put some details in the Facebook group if you can join there and um, if you're not able to get onto Facebook um please just send us a message um, and we'll sort that out for you getting some details on that um we have a wee look and um, just to say we will also be running some um Ikigai hands-on workshop at the oral health conference as well so and um, if anyone wants to come and have a little go get hands-on I think hands-on learning is always so useful as well and um, then please do sign up for that but, uh, I think that's about us we've, we've timed this very well we've done well tonight we've managed to not chat too much <laughs> thank you all thank you Zoe, Nina, Elish and Joe for um, coming tonight and talking all things dental therapy and um, like I said at the start this will be on demand within the next seven days or so so you can watch back and um, there's also a whole host of different um pre-recorded webinars and um, some that you can get CPD for as well that are on the um Ikigai webinar arc webinar archive it's been hard to say and um, so please do check on there and um, there's all kinds of topics as I say so I'm um, good to get some CPD in as well thank you all for coming I'll let you back to your evening Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, guys. Have a nice evening, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.